Hello, everyone. First, I'd like to, th to thank all the TURN Commission and organizers for this amazing event. Uh, today, I'm, I'd like also to introduce myself. I'm Dr. Monica Massantonio, and I'm, I've got my PhD in social psychology, and I'm a visiting professor at the University of York, the UK, at Department of uh, English and Related Literature. It is there that I started focusing in women's letters, although my interests and my access to them have been much wild, uh, wide than um, Lady Mary Waterley Montagu's letters. And what I specifically started focusing in these letters are the emotional aspect and the self aspect of their inner uh, lives and their um, uh, affections and so many aspects that we can see in these letters. I'm going to start sharing my screen with you. So um, we have grief and sorrow in the letters of Lady Mary Waterley Montagu to Mr. Montagu and the importance of tracking emotions and connections and their ethical issues. I understand that uh, it's important to know a little bit more about Lady Mary Waterley Montagu. And so we need to understand letters, not out of their context and their uh, historical and many other aspects. Lady Mary Waterley Montagu was an English aristocrat, but we are going to see that she does not identify herself as an aristocrat. She was also an author and a poet. Uh, she spent part of her life, her early life in England, but then she got married to Edward Waterley Montagu. And as he became the British ambassador in Turkey, antique Constantinople, she followed him. And that's where these amazing Turkish letters come from, from her perspe perspective of the Ottoman Empire and all the cultural diversity that she was able to experience. Also, because of this experience, and she saw people inoculating other people with virus, and there was this big spread of the smallpox, all over Europe and the UK. She introduced that and asked doctors to do that to her children in the UK. She was called, of course, crazy, etc. But now it is recognized that she was the first woman, woman to introduce that. And a statue has been made. And this should be spread because women, and this is a an hypothesis that I've been carrying. Uh, they did all that mixed up in the letters and full of emotions. And they were not recognized by that, but they were doing science experiments and so many other things within the letters. Uh, so much beyond the Turkish letter, which is the most well-known um, uh, letters from her. Uh, and she also had a very unique approach to that. She says like, I look upon the Turkish women as the only three people in the empire and so on. So she did not relate to the world as if she was like an aristocrat and the world is here. No, she, she related to the world in equal terms. And that's why her past letters become so actual and so important. So she was in equal terms with the world. She wrote extensively about the, this difference, but she wrote much more. And we are going to see that all through her life. In her complete uh, letter collections. There are three volumes published by the University of Oxford, and I focus in the third volume, which is her late years 
writings, which is totally different from someone or herself when she was 20, and we are going to see that. So the same person writing a letter to the same husband in her 20s and in her 60s is a totally different new person and version of this person. So we are going to analyze this, and it's important to understand how each letter is uh, related to one person's timeline, and not only the historical timeline. So in her, in her 60s, in these 10 years that we are going to analyze, she wrote 56 letters to her daughter. So her daughter is number one, and she was saying about her grandchildren, her family life, how she should study and be a learned woman like herself, and so on. 21 letters to Waterley. Waterley was her former husband, although they lived all their life these 40 years apart, but she correspondedly, really smoothly and steadily with him all through her lifetime. He was an important person to her and not only uh, somebody that's got a title, etc. And then she, of course, wrote to some other aristocrats and people um, in her circle and one letter to and from her son because she, he was not behaving in accord to her expectations and so on. But in volume one, if we can see, look at the balance. In volume one, she just wrote 11 letters to her doctor and 63 letters to Mr. Waterley. So it's totally different. And I wanted to show that and share with you. Another thing that is very peculiar about her studies is that people call, sometimes I've seen articles all around, Lady Mary. And they say, oh, Lady Mary. But I disagree. I think she was not a Lady Mary. And we need to respect the way a person signs their own letter. We have to use that word, that term. And this is one of the ethical aspects. And here we have M.W. Montagu, M. Waterley, W.M.S., Mary Waterley Montagu. So her name is Mary Waterley Montagu, full stop. Lady Mary, for me, coming from an Italian background, is the mother of Jesus. I was like, but she's no Lady Mary. If she signed any letter like that, I would respect for sure, but she doesn't. She doesn't recognize herself as so. Okay, another aspect that I'd like to pinpoint today is that I always combine a mix of quantitative and qualitative analysis because the quantitative gives me an overview of the whole uh, letter collection that I selected to study and the qualitative, I can go deep into each aspect and create my own categories for the aspects that I'm framing. Uh, and I also think um, I want to find and develop more like the mapping of the letters, who she wrote to and where these people were and creating circles of this letter, as I call, continents and so on. And this combined methods can bring more clarity to our understanding and of this letter and multiple relations. This is Mr. Waterley painted also with all these orient orientalism uh, characteristic that was fashionable at the, their time. And we can see 1713, her letter to him. I have not written because I expected you every day. Uh, your little boy is well. The man is obstinate in having the letter this night. So probably her child, their child asking for news from their father and so on. So this is one kind of emotion of someone who is 20 something and with a young child and looking forward to their father. Then we go to her letter, we jump to 1752, 40 years later, what is she writing to the same man? 
So I received last night yours of January, which has given me the greatest anxiety. Uh, I cannot form to myself any conjuncture of the adventure you mentioned. I have never heard about your son since then. Uh, there's very little known here from England. Uh, I know not where to direct to my son. And so now we can start seeing other emotions like worry, anxiety, grief, uh, multiple emotions and more complex. Um, okay, and also the next letter we can see, it relieved me from a great deal of pain occasions by your silence. So she wants to keep up corresponding to him and she longs for his letters uh, in a new way. Uh, okay, so... Uh, I hope your health continues good. So again, the, the topic of health is going to be a constant in these late times. Uh, I write long letters to my daughter and would do the same to you if it was as easy to me to write this large hand as the small running one I'm used to. So she usually, she also says she usually writes small hands and small letters and so many things. But she doesn't write the usual letter. She writes letters, and that's my other hypothesis, as literature. And she knows that. We are going to see soon. Uh, so um, I have written again from for you and from my daughter. Have I have not heard from you both. Uh, and also she starts distributing her belongings, like jewelry, china, porcelain, to some of her uh, closest people. Um, and she says, like here, here there are two or three English ladies, but their time of life and mine are so different. We do, don't, we do not meet often. They are generally engaged in diversions, which I have neither inclination nor spirits protect. So she was a lady of knowledge, of I learned women. She wouldn't go just, you know, like many people or women of her time, uh, taking attention only to the outside. Uh, again, I wrote to you and long has been that I have not received any answers. Um, she was also sick many times. She speaks about that. She has been recommended air, air and water, which I think it's fabulous, uh, especially in the during COVID times. So it's basically what we've been recommended and, uh, and so on. Uh, and another thing that uh, the certainty of letters being opened puts a great restraint on my pain. So she knew that her letters could be opened and she was very careful of what she wrote. She could even perhaps write deeper things. Uh, here, another one, also 15, uh, 1753. Uh, he's got a stone in his kidney. And here, I want to show you something that is very peculiar. Uh, she met, a, somebody started talking to her uh, and says, the, the, the the person observed, he told me I had done a great deal of business that morning. I said, no, I just wrote to my daughter on family affairs. Uh, he said, people like your excellence do not write long letters upon trifles, I assure you. So uh, people also could picture that she was not writing a uh, usual letter of her time. She was, was writing the letter of her time with provoking um, single thoughts, ideals, and so much more. Okay. Um, and I would say that these letters are glasses to access her way of being in the world, to understanding her fully, and not just aspects of the external influences 
and characteristics. 40 years earlier, we can see here a letter Friday. I wrote here Friday night thinking. Um, I tremble for what we are doing. Are you sure you love me forever? Shall we never repent? I fear and I hope. I foresee all that will happen on this occasion. So uh, I'll be only yours and I will do what you please. You shall hear from me again. My resolution is taken. Love me and use me well. So she was having second thoughts. Will we love each other? Will this last? What will happen to us? But let's go for it. So it's amazing where how we can connect to these emotions and bringing one of the conclusions that I bring to the quality analysis is that emotions don't change for hundred years afterwards. We, there are people still thinking about that on Friday nights. I will go to the qual quantitative analysis and that's uh, uh, the system gives us the paragraphs, punctuations, how long I take to read all the 21 letters and the main density of words and phrases. So here is the proof that they are, these letters are focused. Although she is writing to Waterley, her topic of her daughter, her health, hope, good, London, are present and are the main topics addressed in your letters. Finally, the visual figure of these letters. Again, we can see Waterley, you, health, recommend, Okay, and daughter. All in all, Lady Mary Waterley Montagu was an avant-garde. I would say for today, we could say she was an influencer. She was somebody that stood ahead of her time, setting, pushing boundaries, uh, questioning values, questioning scientific knowledge, testing, and writing in a literature style. And literature, I, I use this term as art in an artistic way. And when we say, she doesn't say, oh, it's raining, it's pouring water. She says, rain comes as last winter and we shall have and feel uh, the density of the water again. So she writes in a very unique way and peculiar and um, very uh, unique form, format. Um, I understand that there are some follow-ups. I want to now uh, follow up with understanding her relationship with her daughter through these letters and what she wanted to say so much to her daughter. <laughs> and also trying to transform, that's another challenge that I'm pursuing, transform these letters into new medias and interactive medias because there are many women asking themselves what we'll do, why shouldn't we correspond to each other much more often to express yourself and not only share facts especially in the actual social medias that we have. These are my main issues and concerns uh, in terms of letter studies. So it's not, not be biased when looking towards the past. I, when I started reading her letters, I took off from my mind all the previous articles and focused in how I would receive these letters from my background um, and communicating myself with these letters. I also didn't use non given categories like, oh, the epistolary woman or the 18th century woman, and she did. No, I want to understand Lady Mary Water Montagu as a full person. I'm not, I'm not a 21st woman. I'm a full person with things from here, from the past, from the future, and from everywhere. 
and also the intimacy narratives, and um, we uh, which connects number three and four. We don't have any consent to scrutinize these letters, so we need to be very careful not to judge them and not to do this. We are these and these letters because they have no way to answer to us. So I did in my position as a researcher, like Montagu, and I learned with her, I did like this. And I, it was a researcher from the 21st century talking, dialogating, and exchanging with a woman from the 17th century. And the emotions are what connect us all, no matter how distant. So we understand them, that I understand letter as process and not crystallized data in time and space. That's why I say that we've got to find new ways, methods and theories to revive and communicate with these letters with all our respect. Finally, uh, uh, I want to go on into mapping uh, uh, sources and methodology, and also uh, the importance of uh, developing new methods to understand personal letters. I thank you all very much, and I'm available at this email. Should you have any questions, collaboration, or anything that you would like to contact me with? Thank you so much.